give Dr. Charlesworth uh, the full amount of time that he needs, because today is really, really going to hook us back into the New Testament with John the Baptizer, as he calls him, and Jesus of Nazareth, and from, there. From Nazareth. From Nazareth. Those from are two Nazareth. Names, those are two names I changed. From Nazareth. Um, and their, what we, their relationship, if any, to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Charlesworth and thank him again for his time and uh, being with us. <laughs> two handouts. One is about helping the foundation and signing up. Those who give me the sign up, which means you would like to be included in a trip to the Holy Land, I will give you some pottery that's 2,000 years old and explain it to you. That is at the end. You also have a handout that we will go through quickly. John the Baptizer, you have heard him as John the Baptist, but he was known by his activity. And it is a participle when he's often introduced in the New Testament. What is unique about this John, he was the Baptizer. Jesus from Nazareth. I am running a long argument with many Jews that Jesus belongs to Nazareth, but it is not a genitive of identity, Jesus of Nazareth, but a genitive of origins. This goes back to your junior high school. The people here had good classes in English. My students don't know what I just said. The difference, <laughs> the difference between a genitive of origin and a difference that, and a, a, a genitive of identity. Jesus is not identified five by Nazareth. There are genitives in the Greek of the New Testament, apo to Nazarenu, from Nazareth. In March, you will see a major discovery feature, which I can't tell you about. But, because I've signed, you know, non-disclosure. But it's two hours in March, and I will let you know through the savants. The French... Well, your French is good, yes. Okay. Well, it's a long word. Uh, and the argument is, Jesus has to have been buried in Nazareth. He's Jesus of Nazareth. It's not identifying him. He has left Nazareth. Now, most of you know he was thrown out of Nazareth. Okay. Now we start with J.B. For reasons of faith, I can refer to J.B., but never to J.C. <laughs> Which I didn't. You thought I did. J.B. and Qumran. There must be some connection same time, same area. We're talking within a few miles. I don't mean that technically three miles. I know few have to be very careful when you're writing, but I'm not writing. I don't mean three miles. It's maybe seven miles, which is nothing. We have not excavated a watch from the first century yet. Okay, so they don't know times as you do. Same area, same, same period of history. Same type of Judaism. Now it gets very interesting. It's an apocalyptic eschatological movement John is leading. And it's an apocalyptic eschatological movement Jesus is, is leading. Apocalyptic means the heavens have been opened and something is being apocalyptically revealed. A revelation. Something big is about to happen. Eschatology means the last things, the last days. Both J.B. and Jesus believe that they were living in the last moments of history. When you do theology, Stacy, people are very embarrassed. They say, how is it possible? Jesus must have been so screwed up because he thought this was the end of time. But what is time? It is not a theological concept for God. It's an anthropological concept for the human. When I was lecturing in Addis Ababa at the millennium, which was not 2000, their millennium is different. 2008. I made the point that time is a human concept. 
And I said, we don't know, some of us who just come in, what time it is. Our watches tell us one time, our body tells us another time. We are moving through time, and we land in different places and different times. Many of you have with me crossed the timeline, so we lose a day. Really very strange. Now, what am I saying? The Bible says, a thousand years is but a moment in his eyes. What are we talking about? When I was in astrophysics, we studied light, and we couldn't believe it. Light that has traveled to our eyes for 100,000 years. What's 100,000 years? Civilization broke on this continent, well, on this little globe, around 10,000 BC. What's 100,000? Today, astrophysicists are seeing light that has traveled 12.5 five billion years. The earth won't last a little more than three billion. The sun maybe ten billion. That's our best estimate. What is light? If it loses point oh 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 one of its power, it wouldn't make it a billion years. Twelve point five. Bobby, it's come twelve point five billion years. What is time? And how absurd of us to say, it's been a long time. <laughs> Jesus is our contemporary. It hasn't been so long. All right, I won't get to each one of these points. Can I, I, I need a, a, at least an hour, right, for us? <laughs> for us is saying, yes, yes. And John Hoffman, both of them, they both. They made a unique choice of scripture, where 99% of the Jews at that time are not choosing prophecy. This little group is choosing prophecy. This little group, JB and the Qumranites, are choosing Isaiah. This little tiny group, is a lawyer in the group? Do we have a lawyer here? All right, it's a pity because, uh, I, yeah, I know, don't say it. We wish the lawyers would come to church more often. <laughs> they not only choose Isaiah, they not only choose Isaiah 40, they not only choose Isaiah 43, but they're the only people in history that interpret it that way. This is where a lawyer said that's the only point you have to make. The lawyers, when I ask them, and I often speak to maybe a hundred of them once, I say, what, how many points do you have to have to win a case? Ten, five, one. Bruno Molly shoes would have done it. DNA will never do it. No one knows what it is, okay? But when you're talking to the jury of your peers, they're not your peers if you're a lawyer. They are supposed to be peers of the person uh, being examined. No one had Bruno Molly shoes. Now, you will know exactly what I'm referring to. If not, you can call uh, and get a collect call on that. <laughs> call. Corre, a voice is calling. Bimithbar Panu Derek Adonai, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Only JB, John the Baptizer, and the Qumranites interpreted that way. Now you know sociologically why they are in the wilderness, why they have gone to the Mithbar. They are in the wilderness because the voice called them. In the wilderness the way of the Lord. Jesus doesn't interpret it that way. You don't interpret it that way. No Jew in history that we know of ever interpreted it that way. How do they interpret it? A voice is crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. That's enough. Case closed. There has to be an unbelievable link between John the Baptizer and Qumran. Fire and brimstone. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Raid out of the hatred, the apocalyptic fire of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's what I'm quoting J.B. Water for immersion. At Qumran, you say, I've never seen so, so many swimming pools. This person didn't get an A-. minus. <laughs> to even give him an F is to acknowledge that the person is alive. <laughs> there are no swimming pools. These are mikvah oat. Now, we didn't know it when I was working with DeVoe in the 50s and 60s. 
we have become aware of what a nikva is. And I just finished an article, and I sent it to the Philippines on Friday, about Jesus going into the mikvah oat. And the man at Bethsatha going into the mikvah oat. And then we have found two of the greatest mikvah oats, and only the Gospel of John knows about him. The one at Siloam and the one at Bethsatha. But the greatest mikvah in the world is the Jordan River because you need living fresh water, fresh water. It cannot be carried by the humans. Now, of course, Jews get very clever. They design, design uh, uh, oxen with big bowls on their ears. So when the oxen bend down to get water, they come up. But the human has not moved it. <laughs> so it is mayim hayim. It is eschatological water. But only at Qumran and only among John the Baptist is the mikvah. That is, you have to go into water in full immersion. At Qumran, we have a lot of mikvah oat, many. Why? For the ritual purification. Ascetic. What is JB's wife's name? No, he's an ascetic. Now, what is the only ascetic group that we know of? Pharisees, no. Jesus, no. Jesus group, no. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Well, the only way you get a mother-in-law is having a wife, right? <laughs> but maybe the wife is dead. We get into forensic anthropology, we can't do that now. But I've held a little baby. It was smaller than my hands. And it was found in the pelvis of a little girl. She wasn't old enough to give birth. Ascetic. J.B. called the Pharisees and Sadducees a brood of vipers. Brood, we get it, maybe people miss it. Offspring. Vipers, children. Where did he get that? It's in the Hodeyot, the hymn book that we're now editing at Qumran. Please realize how important what we're doing. We are now editing the hymn book that was used among this group. And it refers to all the works of the viper. The works mean all the offspring. Where did he get this term? I'm not telling you. You might tell me. The vows to God. What has convinced many Israelis and most people in the world is my work on J.B. and Qumran. Why does John not have a garment? According to Luke, the, the, the soldiers come to him and they said, what do we do, J.B.? They didn't call him J.B. Yochanan. Maose, what should we do, Yochanan? If you have two coats, that's the way he spoke. Had a deep, reverent voice. <laughs> if you have <coughs> two coats, give it to the one who has none. The speaker has none. Why doesn't John receive a cloak? He wears animal skin. Very, very strange. You know that Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, he has a boy there and he has five loaves and two fishes. This is where preachers have to get back to class. They're not dead fish. They would have thrown the boy out because it stinks. This is pickled fish from Migdal. The pickle factory for fish is at Migdal, which is another thing. What do we know about Migdal? Come with me and you'll learn from the archaeologists and what we're seeing. We have found the harbor and it's plastered. We thought, how is this possible? A plastered harbor. Then we realized we had found one at Caesarea Maritima. He ate wild locusts. I have seen the wild locusts. I've, I'm not bringing one. I, I can't imagine eating that. Where's the nutrition in that? And it's awful. Ugly thing, you know. Why would the Jews say that was pure food, that not contaminated? Not my uh, type of Judaism. So he had, how do you explain that? The only explanation, he made a vow at Qumran to God, not to the community. But I will not receive anything from the Beni Hoshek, the sons of darkness. Never. I don't want to be contaminated. I want to be pure. That does it. And then you have to say, well, what would cause him to leave? Oh, it's so simple. In the yearly renewal as you came in, and you would walk in. First you have the priest walk in. They didn't walk backwards. I have to get started again. First you have the priest come in, right? Then you have the Levites come in. 
Then you have the many come in. It's a technical term, Rabin. The many. Have you made it into the many? It's a very technical term. And as you begin to renew the covenant, and you cross over into the covenant of God, only Jesus and the people at Qumran interpret Jeremiah about the new covenant. No one else does that. Why? Jesus could have got it from Qumran, but he could have got it from Jeremiah. He could have got it from Jeremiah through Qumran. You see how important our work is? But during this yearly renewal, I want you to say amen and amen. Have you heard the word amen? <laughs> it's a Hebrew word, you know. And you say it only at the end of, 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 of an affirmation. So say amen and amen when I say, okay, this will be, let's practice, ready? Amen. You come in for the yearly renewal. Cursed are all those who hate God. Amen. At Qumran you say amen and amen. 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 I have to do a little better directing the choir. <laughs> Cursed are those who think they're doing the right thing when they curse the commandments. Amen. Cursed are all those who do not love God and try to do the will of God. Amen. Now you're perfect. Everybody's got an A plus now. Even you, Russ. <laughs> Stacy was still working on you. Now be very careful. Please don't say amen and amen. Curse at all those who are the sons of darkness. So, you know, in the community they would recognize that at a certain time a person could not say that and they have to get him out or he has to leave. Now why would J.B. not say, cursed are all the sons of darkness? Because the quintessential sons of darkness are those SOBs, and it's not as good as sons of darkness. But we don't say it in church. The priest in the temple. And who is J.B.'s father, Zechariah? And who is he? An officiating person in the temple. Well, why didn't he curse his father? Because when he was a little boy, his father taught him the Ten Commandments. And it says, honor your father. So he knew he couldn't do that. So now we have a reason why J.B. leaves. He's out. He, he leaves the community. But remember his vows and his, his points. Now that's, that's it. Jesus uh, is our next subject. And, you know, I've just given you a three-hour lecture in three seconds. You say it was too fast. The point is, listen. John the baptizer is not a member of the community. He had been in the community and he deliberately left because he didn't like their hatred of all who are not in the community. Okay? Jesus. Now some people think he's an Essene. They just haven't done their work. They write books and make a million dollars. If you want to make a million dollars, just pick here and there and you can prove that Jesus was this or that. It's called deductive. You start with he was an Essene and you look for proof of it. That is not Aristotelian. That is not scientific. It's just trying to prove pe to people your position which is not obviously going to be proved by starting with I am going to prove to you that Jesus was a homosexual. People have written those books. Did he not say, did not the evangelist say, he put his head on the, uh, on the chest of the beloved disciple. What man would do that? totally flunking the course because this is the way you eat. You reclined. You reclined around the table. You didn't sit around the table. In fact, I commend it to us. It might be a better way to have a wonderful meal. You recline around the table, you know, and you sit there and relax and talk. And It's not... See, people begin to slouch, you know, that uh, through a lot of time, I have some of my colleagues that are walking like this now. See, uh, sit up. Okay. Jesus was not clearly an Essene, but he was pro-Essene. In Matthew, we have Jesus saying, uh, Blessed are those who look for the coming of the kingdom of God. The only group we know about that clearly are the Qumranites. And he said, you know, some eunuchs are born eunuchs. That clearly means that some men are incapable of having children. Some are made eunuchs by men. Well, you obviously know what that means. And some make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God. He's talking to Jews. You cannot mutilate yourself. So what does that mean, living an ascetic life? It has to be the Qumrayans. The only people...
who have dedicated everything they have, are the Qumranites, and have lived ascetic lives at Qumran for the coming of God's kingdom. Uh, Malkus de Lacha is the Aramaic at Qumran. There are biblical scholars that have written such trash. For example, they claim that Jesus' disciples, not he, made the concept of the kingdom of God, because it can't be taken back to Jesus because it's not in Judaism. They just never had a course in Judaism, which is very sad. And which is very, very sad because some seminaries are now saying we don't want to teach Judaism. Horrible movement going on throughout the world. They have no interest in Jesus. And uh, so much is lost with that kind of a decision. Now, there are some passages uh, that... So Jesus can be pro essene in some points of view, right? We got that? He admired the people that gave up everything for the kingdom of God. And that's exactly, I assume you know a lot about Jesus, that he says, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks backward is not worthy of the kingdom of God. He's thinking about Lot's wife, as you well know. I don't have to illustrate that too. She looked back and became a pillar of salt. But you have to give everything. You have to keep your eyes going forward, no matter how bad uh, times get. Now, I have some texts that just make no sense. I'm going to read to you. Matthew 12, 11. Now, you'll read commentaries on this, and people are trying to make sense of it. It's because they ignore what the Greek says. So I'm going to read, I'm not going to read the Greek to you. I'm going to read, it's what? 12, 11. Okay. And he said to them, Jesus is speaking to a group of people, Jews. Who among you a man? I'm reading the Greek. Oh, I can say, which man among you? But that's not what the Greek says. You have to stay very careful. Which one among you? Which one among you a man? Which man among you? He's talking to men. It's anthropos, so it could be, it's not on air, so it could be which person. Let's move in that direction. Which person among you who has one sheep? Very clear. And it might fall, this sheep, in, on the Sabbath. Notice the place of the noun. On the Sabbath. So what is important in Jesus' question is on the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, which person among you, you who has a sheep, and it falls into a pit? Uche, which means by means, you will say yes, yes to this, would not grab it and pull it out. It's a hard saying. What's the matter with Jesus? Is he having a migraine? I'm going to simply ask you, raise your hand, if you had a sheep and it fell into a well or a pit and was about to drown because of the water, would say, pity, it's Sabbath. <clears throat> yes, good. A plus. You're up to A plus. No! So what is Jesus assuming? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Right? Are you still thinking with me? It just makes no sense. It means there are people in this room... Jesus is assuming there are people in this room, maybe all of you, if you had an animal, you say a dog or a cat or something like that, an animal, it doesn't have to be one sheep. He's talking to people who have sheep. And it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. You say, I'm not going to do any work. I'm not going to do any work. I'm not going to help it out. Raise your hand if you're going to argue. That's exactly your position. Okay. Either Jesus is stupid, a scribe made a mistake copying the text, or there is some evidence that there were people that he was speaking to that would say, boy, I'm not going to work on the Sabbath. I'm not going to help an animal out of the pit. Do you know what we're looking for? It's, you're asking me to do too much. A passage about the Sabbath, a passage that mentions a sheep or an animal, and a pit, and not doing anything to help it. You are asking me to do something that's impossible. That's what you're asking me. You understand what you're asking me? Find me a text that says on the Sabbath, I will not help an animal out of a pit. That's what you're asking me. Here it is. It's in the Damascus document. This is our translation. We published this. <coughs> Let no person or man, 
deliver the young of an animal on the Sabbath day. And if the animal falls into a pit or a ditch, do not raise it on the Sabbath. For the first time, a meaningless saying of Jesus takes on incredible context. He is speaking to some people that have a rule that he thinks is awful. But why? Don't be mad at these people. They are the fundamentalists. They are reading the text. The Lord God said, on the Sabbath day you shall not do any work. What is a work? Any work. <clears throat> to bend down and help that animal was considered to be a work. And no one wants to disobey God, right? We all agree on that. And what Jesus is saying, you are disobeying God by not helping someone live on the Sabbath. You see, from this you get the ideas of his healing miracles, especially in Jerusalem. There's another passage that just makes no sense at all. We turn to Matthew 10. And it's 29 to 31. I brought this for you because you got an A+. plus. This flowers from the Holy Land. <laughs> it was my marker and I thought I would give it to the one. She was brilliant. She, she was saying yes, yes. She was great. She was ahead of every one of you. <laughs> In terms of somatic articulation. <clears throat> now he starts with Uchi again. Is it not true? The answer is of course it is. That two sparrows are sold now this is one sixteenth of a denarius <laughs> you translate it as a penny less, two sparrows for less than a penny what is he saying sparrows are cheap right do you see his point very clear now when I turn to the commentaries there are thirty pages of what is a sparrow what is selling a sparrow how cheap it is how important sparrows are Jesus is not a sparrow specialist <laughs> Why do people spend 30 pages on what we all know? It's very simple. Two sparrows for the infinitesimal coin. What is he doing? He's starting with beautiful rhetoric. Is it not true? Of course it is. Now we hear economics, you know. Sparrows. Not one from them shall fall, the future tense, upon the earth. Sparrow dies on the earth. And you and I have seen sparrows lying on the earth under trees. Not one falls. Not one of them. Two of them you can get for the cheapest price, the tiniest coin. And not one of them falls upon the earth without of the Father. Without what of the Father? We don't have the noun. It's very interesting. Probably reply something related to the Father. But that's not where we're going. That's so clear. No one needs to give us one sentence on that, right? Two sparrows can be bought for the cheapest coin, and not one of them dies without the Father's consent or involvement or love. Maybe it's left out because he knows he's talking to intelligent people. And he started with Uche. Is it not clear that? And it's so clear. What is so clear? They're going to write 30 pages in a commentary. But he started with, all you need to know the Greek, is it not clear? Everybody says, yes, it's very clear. The point has been made. What's your point? Aha. Of you. Concerning you. The hairs. Plural. Of your head. All of them. The hairs of your head. Look at all those little hairs. <laughs> you gotta get on, gotta get you on. Look at that. Somebody here. Why do we say I'm gonna get my hair cut? We get our hairs cut. Look at all the hair. All of them. He makes the point, it's rhetoric. And the hairs of your head, all of them, they have been numbered. No commentary. What is he talking about? The first thing is a theological passive. They have been numbered. God has numbered them. 
Why didn't the commentator say that? What is Jesus saying? God has numbered your hairs of your head. Not one sparrow falls without God being involved, God's will, God's love. And every hair of your head, every one of them has been numbered by God. It's a, it's a theological passage. No question on that. See. What's this about? Is Jesus having a migraine that nobody's talking about? Has a scribe messed up copying the text? Or is there something we don't know about his culture? Now, you are old enough, the beauty of having some years, that you'll know when I talk about when Uncle Sam is afraid of the big bear. Mm -hmm. We all know what that means. But you have to be part of our culture that the United States is fearful of nuclear war with Russia. All of us know that. Now, you have to become part of that context. Where's the code language? We found it. It's again the Damascus document, and it's our translation. And the priest shall order, and they shall sh shave the head. But the skull they shall not shave. Don't ask us what it means. We, we just transliterate it. Something, some part of the hair they're not going to shave. We don't know what skull means, so we give it to you as skull. This is an order that the priest, do you hear this? The priest may count the dead and living hair. That means every hair of your head and see whether there has been added from the living to the dead during the seven days, in which case he is unclean. But if none has been added from the living to the dead, and the altar is filled with blood, and the spirit of life goes up and down, and the affliction is healed. What this text says, you have to go to the priest. Jesus was the first member of the Reformation. He was the first reformer. Don't go to the priest. Go directly to God was one of the mandates of the Reformation. And we are all here in the Reformed tradition, so you know what I'm talking about. We have found the text that makes sense. Don't tell me translating the Dead Sea Scrolls is not important. We would need your help. Now, the next point is hate is institutionalized at Qumran. I gave that to you in the yearly renewal. Let's contrast Jesus, contrast the Bible, contrast Leviticus 19. Love your neighbor as yourself, and we Christians have to do a better job of loving ourselves. We have to. The people that come to me for counseling, they say, and mea culpa, mea culpa, I'm no good, I'm just dung and ashes. And I said, who told you? The priest. And I said, well, actually, the text says, you are imago Dei. Basalmo. We are in the image of God. You are special. You are in the image of God. Be proud. Don't be ashamed. I'm nothing. I need God to forgive me. Thank be to God. Stacy can do this better than me. Our tradition says symbol at the same time. Eustace et peccator. Justify and a sinner. Hatred at Qumran. What is Jesus' main obsession? Love. There is no human being in the history of the human race. China, Olmecs, Aztecs, Aborigines, the Brahmin, the Upanishads, Tao Du Jing, Confucius. No one puts such an emphasis on love that it sounds absurd. It's Jesus. Love your enemies. It's one of my favorite sermons. And John says, a new commandment I give to you. A new commandment. Let's listen. Love one another. How? Bobby, how? As I have loved you. There's a man that we follow to find love as the most important. Purity. At Qumran, they didn't want anything to do with others. They were impure. They were all born to go to hell. Jesus associates with sinners. You know, it's unbelievable. I hear he is talking with prostitutes. Oh. I hear that this man you call Jesus, he associates with tax collectors and even asks one of them to follow him, Levi Matthew. Unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. So this is the absolute opposite anthropologically and sociologically. Jesus dies into the interstices of society, whereas the Essenes stay clear from the pits. At Qumran, you have double predestination and exclusiveness. Jesus leaves JB and he goes to where the people are. Perhaps for Christians today, the most important lesson John learned at Qumran was the coming day of judgment, the apocalyptic now of prophecies, and the following teaching. The following teaching is taught at Qumran, how do you know who the Messiah is? The heavens and the earth will obey the Messiah. Take strength in his mighty works, all you who seek the Lord. Surely the Lord will seek out the pious and will call the righteous by name. His spirit will hover over the poor. He will give power to those who believe. He will glorify the pious with the throne of the eternal kingdom. He will free the captives. He will open the eyes of the blind. He will strengthen those bent down. That means I had to restore the text. And as for the glorious things that are not the work of the Lord, when he, the Messiah, comes, then he will heal the wounded, resurrect the dead, proclaim, proclaim glad tidings to the poor. My translation from On Resurrection, a documented Qumran that we are entitled On Resurrection. It's an exegetical expansion, as you know, of Psalm 146, Isaiah 61, and Isaiah 40. What is very interesting is that J.B.'s boys come to him and say, are you the one who is to come? And what does Jesus say? Go tell John, my teacher. You've read this. Now we turn to Luke. In that hour, Jesus cured many of the diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many that were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered J.B.'s students, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The first criterion at Qumran. But as I told you, John knew. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. That's nowhere in the biblical text. Not in Psalm 146, not Isaiah 61, and not Isaiah 40. It's only in the Qumran text. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed he who takes no offense at me. So the key is very clear from that. Jesus is telling J.B., if these things are occurring, then it's obvious who is the one who is to come. Now the text is about the Messiah. Now that's very helpful to us and I get, gets us into the community. We uh, are going to be looking at some things here in a moment. Many of you know that uh, on the cover of some of the biblical archaeology magazines was something like this. And the claim was it was found at Qumran. I obtained this just a month ago. And I asked the experts on patina, I am not one, where would this patina take shape in the desert? So my suggestion is, if the other one is from Qumran, this could be also. What is it? It's an incense stand used by Jews because they would put a little bowl here and then they put incense on it and they would smell the fragrance of God. This is a reenactment of Eden. The wonderful breath of God, the flowers. When you smell good things, you feel that Eden is not only a thing of the past, but a present experience which underscores the promise of the future. That's Jewish liturgy in the temple and where the Jews are very sacred and, and very spiritually advanced. We have other things to look at here. It depends on our time. I have a lot of things from Caiaphas's house. We are now studying Caiaphas' house, and the foundation is helping support that. But mainly the foundation is now really trying to complete the text and translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, if we'll hit the, uh, the, the shades, we'll get into 
uh, our text uh, for today. What do I conclude? J.B., John the Baptizer, had been a member of the community, but was not fully initiated. And he left and went just a few miles north by the River Jordan and called people to prepare for the coming of God's judgment. Jesus was his disciple for maybe two or three years, Gospel John, first chapters 1 to 3, and then he broke with J.B., and two of J.B.'s students followed him. This is all well known, and uh, uh, then Jesus goes on, and later on, J.B. says, uh, go, go find out, is Jesus the one who is to come? Hoerkomenos. And the key is, Jesus ticks off everything that is a criterion found in the Qumran text. He must have learned it from J.B., because both of them were looking for the one who would come. Today we're going to be looking at John the Baptizer, Jesus from Nazareth, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I completed this in October for you. We're looking here at this, uh, the Sea of Galilee, the breaking in of light. This river Jordan, it flows from the north under Hermon. It's heading south, the Qumran Caves. And sitting in this cave where I love to go for hours when I'm over there looking down and thinking about the past 2,000 years ago. Here are our key questions. Was J.B. a member of the community? And are some of Jesus' saying clarified? I'm just kind of refreshing you what you already know. The defining Jordan, from the Hermon to the Dead Sea. Here is the Yam Elol, the Great Sea. Here is Bashan, Gilead, the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan Rift Valley, which you know was full of water. We showed you last week in 60,000 B.C. Samaria, the Philistine Plain, Judea. The Hebron, Beth Sheva, and Yerushalayim. She Jerusalem and Jericho, and Qumran is right here. Next. We talked about this last week, I think. Didn't we see that last week? I'm sure we did. Can that be yeah. raised a little bit on the screen so that those, like, point the projector up a little higher? And then those of us watching in the back will be able to see it a little bit. Thank you for the suggestion. Yes. Is that it? Yes. That's that's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, this is the Jordan Rift Valley, okay? From the north, Sea of Galilee, all the way down to the Dead Sea. Next one. Does the snow of Lebanon leave the crags of Sion? Syrian. Do the mountain waters run dry, the cold flowing streams? But my people have forgotten me. Jeremiah. Sea of Galilee, looking up at the Hermon. There is a lot of snow today on the Hermon. Living water, the Hermon. Four streams at the base of Mount Hermon converge upon the Jordan River. Here is the water flooring. It's, this time of year is so beautiful to go there. This is about 10 stories high, and you can see it coming out of the mountains and splashing and then splashing again. It's beautiful. The water is flowing, mayim hayim, living water, but only Jesus, Qumran, and J.B. talk about eschatological living water. Next. The Jordan River. I, uh, for many years, would go and run along this path and come back. Herman is up here, and here's the Jordan River. Next. The Jordan River is now feeding, pouring down into Port Qumran. Next. Here are many examples of the Jordan River. There's a joke that people tell in Galilee. Buses stop, and they get out of the bus, these pilgrims from Japan and from uh, other places like Birmingham <laughs> and Orangeville. <laughs> and they stand there and say, this is the mighty Jordan River? Yes. The mighty Jordan River? Yes. And then the response is, mighty good public relations. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your mighty Jordan River. Uh, it, you see how it flows here? And this is uh, Yardinet, one of the traditional sites where uh, Jesus was baptized by John. Next. The Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea. Here it is up here, flowing into the Dead Sea. I hope that's clearer for you than it is for me. It's very fuzzy here. Uh, we're looking down on the 
uh, plain here, uh, which leads up to, to Qumran, up in this area next. Uh, this is a, uh, from the satellites showing you the Jordan Rift Valley, the Dead Sea, and you can see the Herodium, and then the temple is, and the, and the Mediterranean. Today, you probably are shocked how small Israel is. Smaller than New Jersey. Next. Prepare the way of the Lord. Next. Isaiah 43, a voice cries out. This is where they are. Modern road, ignore that. The Dead Sea. They saw this many times, as you're seeing it. God, they thought, breaking from the heavens, sending his light upon those who are faithful to him. And Jesus said he sends his light upon the the good and the poor, the unjust and the just. Uh, here at Qumran, they are preparing, they are hearing a voice. Next. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Here you have it. We went into the desert just a little bit west of Qumran, and here is a highway. Not paved, of course. The Jordan uh, area, a little bit to the west. Uh, the Gideon Desert. Next. The real and imagined desert, a place of danger and refuge. Many is a place of preparation next. You get an idea, this is where this is where JB is baptizing, this is where Qumran is. You see it's not far, just a little you you would say a stone throw, but I can't throw it that far. Uh Beersheba again. And uh yeah, now see I can see it, Jerusalem. I knew it had to be there, but here I cannot see it. This is Jerusalem and Jericho. Next. Desert-like areas along the western side of the Jordan. The Harkonium, which was a fortress built by Herod. Just a desert area. Next. Desert-like areas along the western side of the Jordan Rift. Getting an idea. This is where you prepare the way of the Lord. Next. Going from Jerusalem to Jericho. The road today. Going down. And you can see the geography. Next. The plains of Jericho. As we come down toward Jericho, we come out of the mountains. Jericho is up this way. Next. This is the Herodium. We're down here doing our work, and I took this picture to give you an idea. The fortress built by Herod, which is just west of Qumran. Next. The Judean Desert near the Masaba Monastery. This is the Kedron pouring its way down to the Dead Sea. Next. Streams in the Judean Desert. Next. We're now up on a cliff looking up toward Qumran, the Dead Sea. You don't see anything here. This is Ein Feshka, which makes the point. It's fresh water there. Next. You get an idea of how it is a desert and a wilderness. Next. The lowest part of the earth and the top of Mount Hermon. Water is pouring down, as you have already heard. Next. Discovery and exploration, the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Next. Cave in which I love to sit and look down and think about what happened 2,000 years ago, but you and I know that wasn't so long ago. Next. Wadi Qumran in the Judean Desert during, uh, brings one to Amaro Paris. I want you to see these. You see the camels here? I'm in a helicopter and I'm shooting the camels moving through the desert. I, I couldn't call to them, are you going to Qumran? <laughs> I couldn't call to them. And this is your Maro Terrace. It's a deposits from 60,000 BC. As the sea withdrew, it dropped its deposits and it's Maro. And uh, uh, there are your caves. In which These are many caves here. You have seven, eight, nine right here. You have 4A and 4B here, and behind you you have others. Next. I've never met this man, but uh, I, I hear he has something to tell us about the scroll and the photograph taken 
of the Temple Scroll and given uh, by Princeton Theological Seminary to William Pondo and his family. He is the son of the man that uh, these jars and the scrolls came to. And the most important is the Temple Scroll, which we just published a few months ago. It's near where his shop was, but his shop has been demolished. Next. Qumran K4, 4A, in the Marl Terrace, and the Dry Riverbed. Next. Here you have Hoffman and Jim Joyner, and uh, I think that could be, I don't know who it is. Cave 11. This is where the, the Temple Scroll was found. Obviously, you know my way of referring to myself. It's either a man I have never met, never been introduced to, or I don't know who it is. But it's cave, cave 11, the final cave that we found a thousand caves, but only 11 of them have writings. Next. Here we come on. Yep. Next. This is a helicopter showing you the ruins. Next. Cave 4. The ruins. Next. What I want you to see is uh, this is the wall. This is perfectly north, and this is perfectly north, and my compass shows you it. You see the arrow? And it was added to this wall, so I know they're interested in astrology, astronomy, and calendars. And what's most important is that people do not know this. This is the remains of the 8th century fort from the time of, of Isaiah. Next. A beautiful view of this area. These have been painted recently. Here is the cave I keep telling you about. We don't have a number for it because nothing was found in it. Uh, because it probably that's where the Romans had a, had a major base and they would throw everything away uh, out into the body. Here is a massive tower beginning the northern section of the ruin. Next. Uh, these are replicas. Come and I'll show you a real one. We have it in loose. Uh, and it, these are the tables. The tables are long because scrolls are long. Uh, some of the scrolls are over 30 feet long, so you need a long table to, to roll them out and to read them, to correct them, and to copy. Next. This is extremely important for me because you see the evidence of the earthquake of 31 BC. The person would stand here, and then he would enter into this area, then wait until his time was called. He would then descend all the way down in the mikvah, full immersion, and come up on the other side and notice he will not be touched by someone who's not pure, because he would then become impure. So these are your dividers that the man who is going down will not touch the man that's coming up. Then once you're fully initiated, you would receive your hatchet and your white garment, and you would go in then and become a full member of the community. Next. These are mikvot. You can see how you immerse. Next. Water management in the desert. This is the aqueduct bringing the water from the hills to the west into the community. Next. This is what the community looks like according to our best uh, uh, drawing by Balagi Balogi. It's what we think it looked like 2,000 years ago. Next. Was well, John the Baptist a member of the community? Are some of Jesus' clar sayings clarified? Yes. Next. So uh, that's it, right? <laughs> so that gives you uh, uh, an indication of what we're doing. Now, do you have some questions? I have the lights now, maybe some questions. If you come, uh, if you want, I do have some handouts for you. I mean, some gifts for you. Uh, if you're going to go, uh, these are from Caiaphas's house. <laughs> These are wonderful. They're pilgrim flasks from Pius' house. Uh, where did I get these? <laughs> All right, these are the ones uh, I picked up in Nazareth. Uh, many of you know I was in Fox Channel for about 40 minutes. We have found evidence where, of, of houses from the time of Jesus. And I went in there, and this is what I found. Uh, there's no question, uh, for over 20 years, Jesus lived in Nazareth. And uh, this is Byzantine, so he didn't see that. Uh, this is early Roman, so he would have seen that. And these are the shards I pick up, and uh, helps us better understand uh, Nazareth at, at that time. 
And uh, this is uh, from the cemetery at Qumran, Dead Sea Scroll Cemetery. And uh, you can come and look at these. And I have gifts for you if you filled it out, so I'll give you one. I'm sure you have questions. Okay. Yes, sir. I understand the, uh, the translation process. Uh, uh, it's an enormous endeavor. Uh, have you found contradictions uh, as uh, you and your colleagues have gone along over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years? Contradictions between the uh, scrolls, among the scrolls. I. Let me try to answer your question. I have just published, and I'm going to publish in a couple of weeks, another statement. At Qumran, we have found a copy of Deuteronomy, which is the correct copy. And all your Bibles, I'm referring to Martians, Jews, Roman Catholics, is wrong at Jeremiah, Deuteronomy 27. So we've known that that text was corrupt. But we could only say, it doesn't make any sense. What happened? And I have argued it's a deliberate alteration by the armies in the South, that they have changed the text because the armies in the South have burned the altar, not the temple. The Samaritans never had a temple. They, John Khan has burned it. So the text has to be changed. God can't say that this is a wonderful place to build a temple, right? And uh, so we, all our texts, thousands of them, are all wrong. But lo and behold, we, we found there was an old Greek text that had it correct, but you can't do much with that. And we found an old Latin text, a very old Latin text that had it correct. Now I have published a photograph of a Hebrew text that has Deuteronomy correctly. And so that will be changing your bodies. Okay? It's a wonderful question. Contradictions. That is, the passage in your Bible in 27 contradicts the rest of Deuteronomy. Okay? In Deuteronomy, there are two mountains. The mountain of curse, Ebal, and the mountain of blessing, Gerizim. And lo and behold, in your text of Deuteronomy, it says, and go up to Ebal and build me the beautiful temple. But the text we know, 30, 40 years ago, people were writing, not even knowing what I shared with you, saying this has to be a corruption. And I am arguing it's a deliberate cor corruption. When the Judean armies attack Samaria and burn the Samaritan temple, they're not going to have a text that says, build my temple on Gerizim. They'll, they change it to Ebal. And now we have a reason. So it gets very exciting. We can correct our text. I mean, the text is very simple. In 27, your text says, and Moses says, God tells you to build an altar to me on Mount Ebal. And they gathered immediately on Mount Gerizim and praised the Lord. And from there, and to the beginning and to the end, in Deuteronomy, the Mount of Blessing is Gerizim. And I thought, it's a deliberate alteration. Now this gets exciting to me, because I can now understand, no one has tried to ask, why did the scribes come to quiz Jesus? No one's asked that. The scribes and Pharisees sent out from Jerusalem, came to Jesus and asked him. But why would scribes ask him? He must know that the Samaritan Pentateuch, which we're about to publish in English any moment, uh, maybe there this week. It was finished three years ago. Um, yeah, that's what probably with the problem is. Um, he must know these texts. And he must know those Judean armies and the Judean scribes are changing God's word. So it gives you another idea of social dynamics. Jesus can now have a relationship to Samaritans that makes sense. You ask wonderful questions, and I can't just say yes. I need to fill your mind with, wow, we are now, it's a great blessing that what we're, what we're doing for our, our global church. It's not just here. Here in Lawrenceville, is that where we are? <laughs> <laughs> but in Beijing, where I've been, in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, and, and uh, Nanking, and uh, in Berlin, in Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv, and, and Galilee, where we've had all these lectures, you name it, uh, my, my sister just sent me a, a, a map for Christmas, which I haven't done much with. It's called a scratch map. And you're supposed to scratch where you've been. Well, I haven't had a chance to do my scratching yet. But that will be a nice little thing to scratch it and see all the places where over my career I've lectured.